Okay. Hey, so just making sure everyone can hear me uh, in the back. Audio good? All right, perfect. Um, so uh, if anyone doesn't know me, my name is Dustin Chow. Uh, today I'm going to talk about CSS and JavaScript. And so uh, first of all, I just wanted to say it's a pretty good turnout for what I thought was kind of a niche topic. So I'm really enthused by that. I'm really excited to talk about this today. Um, so the high level agenda of what I plan to do is we'll start with um, the drawbacks of CSS. So some problems of CSS uh, that I think any developer can run into. And then from this foundation, we'll then construct um, why CSS and JS exists and um, you know, how it's solving these, these drawbacks of CSS that I think are actual real problems. Uh, along the way, we'll talk about some libraries that can instrument and uh, let you author in CSS and JavaScript, as well as some tooling. Uh, and then we'll end up uh, with some drawbacks of CSS and, and, and JavaScript in the interest of fairness um, to construct you know, the argument of drawbacks of CSS, drawbacks of this. Um, it's not a perfect solution, um, and so I urge you uh, at the end of this to think about whether uh, it's actually whether you actually have these drawbacks of CSS and whether this can actually you know fix these drawbacks. So um, yeah, it's kind of the whole point of the talk. So the classic introductory slide: Who's this guy? Does he actually know what he's talking about? Um, so my name is Dustin Chow, uh, and I think I know what I'm talking about. So uh, I'm a front-end developer specializing in kind of all things JavaScript. I started my career at Union Pacific, and then about a year and a half ago, I went to Object Partners. Uh, and so along the way, I've been, been lucky enough to do front-end pretty much anything. So you name it, whether it's jQuery or, Java, or J jQuery or Angular or React, web components, uh, React Native or Cordova. Uh, I've done projects in it, and so I've been lucky, not, I've been lucky to have my, pot, my hand in that, in that pot. Um, so also, this is a CSS talk, so I've done a fair bit of that as well. So whether that's vanilla CSS, um, preprocessors like Less or SAS, CSS modules, and you know, of course, CSS and JavaScript. Um, so I think I'm qualified to talk on this topic, and I hope you guys will agree. Um, so also check me out on Twitter, on my GitHub, on my personal website, if you want to learn more about the, uh, any of that stuff, or just talk to me. And so uh, I do work at, like I said, a company called Object Partners. It's a great company. Um, we specialize in JVM and front-end development of all sorts. Um, we have about 100 consultants between here, Minneapolis, and Chicago. Um, and so if you'd, like to know, if you'd like to know more about Object Partners or what I do at Object Partners, um, come talk to me after, and I'd be happy to talk about it. And so I had this slide on Thunder Plains. So I'll be doing my first ever conference talk uh, at Thunder Plains um, November 3rd in Oklahoma City. So it's a, single, it's a singularly focused JavaScript conference in Oklahoma City. Um, and I'll actually be giving this talk. Um, so this talk is a little bit of a dry run. So um, I think I'm pretty prepared for this. But uh, really what I'm after is some feedback. So good, bad, or otherwise, <coughs> let me know what you thought, whether I could improve things, um, you know, whether I missed out on something that you think I should have included. If there's any kind of feedback, uh, let me know. And so at the end, I'll have a feedback form, but it doesn't need to be that formal. Just let me know what you think, and I will uh, try to adapt to that. So this emoji is what I think a lot of people um, feel or think when they um, think of CSS and JavaScript. It's kind of, it kind of hurts you to think about because it goes against everything we've been taught with the separation of concerns. So HTML should be in an HTML file. CSS should be in a CSS file. And JavaScript should be in a JavaScript file. And so I think, you know, intuitively when you first look at this, it feels weird, it feels unclean, and it feels like it's a solution looking for a problem. And so uh, my goal is to not let this, you know, first perception uh, drown out what I think is actually a valuable tool. And so my, my hope is that by the end of this talk, you'll at least be here, <laughs> which is um, what I'm going to call slightly skeptical but possibly appreciative of some of the benefits. And you could actually see yourself, you know, maybe someday using this tool. I'm also an idealist. So maybe there's people in here who already have some experience with this tool, and maybe they already like it, and maybe uh, they'll love it after this. And so uh, that'd be great. Uh, the the like, high-level goal of this is that I want you to leave here with a greater understanding of the problems of CSS, how CSS and JavaScript can solve some of these problems, and from that, make an informed decision on whether or not you could use this in your application. So I'd like to start by illustrating the problems with CSS. And so I, I think it's a pretty common slide in a lot of these type of talks. Um, and, and, but what, one thing I don't like about a lot of them is that they uh, kind of describe this problem with CSS at scale. And typically that's described at Facebook scale. And um, I think that kind of drowns out the argument. I don't think we all work in Facebook scale. And so I'd like to approach the problem from more of you know, the average developer scale. You know, we're working with maybe a million users you know, every couple months, not you know, the Facebook scale. So. Um, my examples are a little more down to earth, a little more approachable, and so I think that helps construct the argument a little more, um, a little better for you know, um, non Facebook developers. So we have, uh, let's say I'm a front end developer, 
and we have a design team, uh, and we're working on this application. And we have this button component that we've been tasked to build. Um, and so the, you know, the, this is all CSS, this is vanilla CSS. And so this button has some hover effects. So I can hover it, uh, I press it, it can depress. Um, it looks pretty good, this is you know, a great looking button. And I feel pretty confident that this code going forward uh, is pretty solid, um, it's not super verbose, and I can understand what's going on. But the next day, we get a request from you know, our client or the design team that, hey, you know, all our buttons uh, can't be green. Um, some of these buttons need to have this white um, style so that they can be like a secondary button. So you know, the, the, the green button is the primary button, and this button is the secondary button used to like reset a form or something like that. And so you know, I add this code, I add this selector, and this works fine. So uh, hopefully everyone back can see this. This is a really small button. And so we get asked to uh, design this component, uh, extend this component that um, you know, it needs to be in like a, like a side menu or something, or it needs to be in an area of the page where it needs to be smaller. So uh, we create it, works fine. I, I you know, shrink the font size, reduce the padding, and this button now you know, can be uh, tiny sized. And then finally, um, we get one final request that, hey, you know, that, that, that button, we, we, we really like it a lot, but we'd like it to have our hover style. So uh, when you hover over it, you know, it'll invert. And so we design all of this. Um, you know, this all works great, except our clean CSS, you know, that initial base uh, of which we, you know, we were, we were really happy with our button because it was just this one singularly focused thing is now polluted with all of these, which are actually, in effect, globals. So the secondary... Um, is a selector, it's a global. This tiny is a global. The secondary with a hover is a global. But we've introduced globals into our code base, and anyone who you know, has done JavaScript in particular knows that globals are kind of the enemy. And so there have been tools, you know, recent, semi-recently, like Webpack and Rollup, that lets you um, kind of rid your code base of globals in JavaScript. Um, and so uh, this isn't as easy to do in CSS because of the kind of deficiencies of these uh, global selectors. And so I can actually illustrate this. So if you're one, you know, one guy or girl, I'm working on an application, you're the lone developer, um, you're going to understand you know, what you've written. But if you're a second person coming onto the team in a couple months, you're not going to necessarily understand that you know, there are all these classes. I don't, I'm not going to necessarily be able to go into all these components and figure out what each of them do. Um, so uh, I get tasked down, down the road. Um, I guess someone else in the project is tasked down the road to design a simple link uh, in the side menu um, that was link. And so they use the classes button and secondary. And when they uh, put it on the page, they're thinking, well, this isn't quite what I wanted. This looks like a button. Uh, it's because you know, our globals that we defined for that button are kind of clashing, and they're using them when they didn't mean to. And so uh, what they do um, is they um, style this um, with you know, this white color and this background color blue. We click through. Oh, it doesn't actually update. Click through, uh, and then you know this actually works like we'd expect. But we're using important, you know, which is a big no-no in CSS. Uh, this is not great code, but it's working. And then you know we could ask for another but another link um, that you know is slightly different style, but we need both of them to exist on the same page. So we tie in. We use this you know cascading style to uh, make the rule more specific, so that this rule will then win. And then we get you know our white our white background and blue text. So um, Globals, like I said, are the enemy. This, is, this applies to JavaScript and to CSS. Um, you don't want your code base to be full of globals, and CSS is really inherently global-based. But I think a lot of you are probably thinking, well, um, you know, that, that's true, but there are a lot of ways to author your CSS um, in things like BEM. So this is called, this is a, an authoring methodology called BEM. There's also atomic CSS, object-oriented CSS. A bunch of these exist, these naming strategies, to prevent you from uh, this, this kind of uh, global problem. And so if anyone is not familiar with BEM, basically what it is is the first part of the selector is the block, so in this case a form. The second part of the selector is the element, so in this case a submit button. And then the final one is a modifier, in this case like a state. So this would target um, a submit button in this form that's disabled. And so these methodologies, they, they do work. They, they do solve this global problem. But when I see code like that, I want to run away. Uh, it makes it, um, it's, it's, it, 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 naming is a, a notoriously hard problem, and when I have to think of this stuff while I'm writing my, you know, uh, CSS, 
Uh, it just introduces a cognitive overhead that I don't want to introduce into my mind. I want to focus on developing. So actually this guy is running the wrong way. So other way, run away from it. Um, and so uh, there's a really applicable tweet by Kent C. Dodds, super smart guy, works at PayPal. He says, I don't use CSS and, and JS to be cool or hip. I use it because my brain is limited and CSS and JS automate stuff from my brain. And so this is really, I think, the, the kind of crux of the issue. Um, why, why use this, this things like BAM's, BAM and Atomic CSS when we can use this CSS and JS tooling to automate that, what is really an easy problem of you know, naming if we just auto automate it, um, and so use this tooling to eliminate any of that cognitive overhead. And so CSS and JS, I think, really does solve this problem uh, of, the, of globals. So some of you also may have been thinking, well, there are these you know, newer uh, techniques um, called CSS modules and then Shadow DOM. So if anyone is not familiar with CSS modules, it's really a um, build tie-in. It actually is CSS and JavaScript. So if you like CSS modules, I think you'll like some of this stuff as well. But um, using things like Webpack and uh, CSS Loader, um, you can uh, define what is local to your CSS and what is global to your CSS, and then you can generate a unique class name uh, based on that stuff. And so Shadow DOM is a stage aspect of web components um, that really layman's version description of it. Um, it kind of encapsulates um, your component and all of your global styles into a single subsection of the DOM. And so you can write global styles, but it won't impact the larger subset of the DOM. So Shadow DOM is really, really cool, except the browser support is not that great. And so I do think web components are going to you know, keep getting more and more popular. And I think this technology is going to become more and more standardized. But now, if you wanted to use Shadow DOM, you're basically saying, well, I'm not going to support IE. I'm not going to support Edge. I'm not going to support Firefox without a polyfill. And then Safari just shipped support for it like two or three weeks ago. Um, and I'm not sure how solid it is. I think there are still some outstanding issues. Um, so basically, I'm not saying, you know, don't use the Shadow DOM. I think the Shadow DOM is really cool. Uh, but in the interim, until the Shadow DOM is formalized and until we develop tooling around it, CSS and JS is still a great uh, technique to use that, that can do some of the same things as Shadow DOM. So I have this slide, CSS does not scale. And so this is really a side effect of the whole globals thing. And so that earlier example of you know, writing that button is uh, really a small scale um, example of how CSS does not scale. So um, each time you, know, you get a different request from a customer or a different request from a user to, hey, you know, I'd like this button to look a little differently, or this component needs to look differently when it's rendered in this particular screen. Each time you're adding globals, uh, and each time your CSS is getting harder to maintain, um, harder to like reason about, and then especially I think it's harder for people for future uh, developers to work on your work on your code. And so, um, the other thing I wanted to mention is generally when I when I think I hear it does not scale, I think the person just doesn't like that technology. I think it's kind of like a cop out. Uh, but I do like CSS, and CSS and JS uses CSS, so I, I do think this is actually a valid criticism of CSS. And in general, the bigger your application gets. The more CSS you write, which creates more globals and a harder to maintain application. So uh, this is dead code elimination. So anyone who's ever refactored a large app uh, knows that it can be incredibly difficult to refactor what is effectively unused CSS. So if we get a request that, hey, I like this button style gone, like we don't have a need for secondary inverted buttons anymore, you can go in and use that, but that that, or you can go in and remove that, but that uh, removal could lead to unforeseen circumstances because you're effectively removing globals that uh, either different components could be relying on, or you could be changing how a certain piece of your application works. And you don't really know until going in and you know, using the application, QA testing it, uh, whether or not you've actually broken something. Um, so this is a re really actually a real problem of CSS. And then so we'll get into it in the CSS and JS section, but CSS and JS gives you confidence that by removing this you know, single JavaScript component, you are only removing code applicable to that component. You're not, you're not touching anything else global. You can uh, delete this button without worry that you're impacting something else in a different part of your application. So this whole sharing constants, I think it's a little bit of a niche concern, but I do think it's worth mentioning. So on the left, we have this super simple button. Uh, it's using CSS variables, so we define at the root, this is basically a global variable in CSS um, of this color. And then this button class is just applying this color. And then because for, for some reason, I think this actually does happen a lot, whether it's colors or breakpoints um, or you know, padding, um, some kind of value defined in your CSS, you often want to also use that value in, in JavaScript. And so I've seen this code actually more times than I'd like to admit. 
um, you see keep in sync with button.css and then keep in sync with button.js. And so this is just fragile and brittle and it's, it's, it's inevitably going to fall through the cracks when you do change it. Someone's going to ignore that comment. There are, you know, there are, I've also seen like a JSON file full of like your branding standards and then a build tool to kind of automate this for you. Uh, but what's nice about CSS and JavaScript is you don't have to use that. It's inherently baked in when you're writing your styles in JavaScript. And so uh, I'd, I'd like to give credit where credit is due. Uh, a really smart guy at Facebook, uh, Christopher Shadow, um, he illustrated a lot of these problems um, actually several years ago. And so a lot of these problems I've been talking about are actually right from you know, his seven uh, issues. Uh, but this kind of does come down to the issue I was talking about where this is Facebook scale. And so each of these I don't think our college developers are going to run into at non-Facebook scale. But I, I, I do think it's interesting because this slide and really this whole presentation he gave was kind of formative to this whole CSS and JS uh, technique. And so at the end, um, if you guys want to check it out, um, his talk is definitely worth watching because uh, like I said, it was formative to this whole um, technology. Okay, so I feel like I've kind of been railing on CSS. And so a quick little anecdote. Uh, early on in my career, I was in a meeting where I told someone that the solution idea uh, that they proposed wasn't good and then I kind of gave like a one, two, three of why I didn't think it was good. And then this guy said, if you can't bring anything, anything to the table, then don't bring anything at all. And so I thought he was a total ass. And, but I, I did take that kind of to heart. So there's not a lot of value in just criticizing something unless you're bringing something to the table. And so from this point forward, I'm not going to be too negative about CSS. CSS is great. Um, and I just want to make it clear that um, if you're not having these problems, that's OK. Uh, I still think there is still value to this whole CSS and JS uh, technique. The very first slide, CSS is not broken. Anyone who says otherwise I think is probably biased or not really giving you the full picture. Um, so I want to be very clear here, if you haven't seen yourself running into any of these problems, uh, that's fine. Uh, if you leave here convinced, that's fine. CSS is not going anywhere. It'll still exist. It'll still be around. Um, and the other thing, it's not CSS and JS or CSS. CSS and JS uses CSS. So learning CSS and you know, leveraging its rules is still valuable. You still will we'll still always need CSS. Um, so definitely don't take from this talk that can't use CSS anymore, it's garbage and it's terrible. Not what I'm saying. Um, I think it has some drawbacks that CSS and JS can fix, and we'll talk about those in a bit. And really the whole thing about CSS and JS is really this kind of refrain of, well, maybe we can do better. Maybe by, maybe by writing these styles uh, in JavaScript, maybe we can actually solve some of these drawbacks of CSS. Maybe there's actually some validity to this practice, and maybe it can really improve the quality and maintainability of your styling solution to your apps and websites, et cetera. Maybe we'll see. So again, a kind of caveat. So this is a, guy, a quote uh, from Ben Lesh, who's a Googler. Uh, moving from storing my CSS, JavaScript, and HTML in different files to physically putting them on different drives, keep those concerns separate. So clearly he's joking. But I, I'd like to you know, talk about this quote uh, because this, this is really the crux of the issue. Um, people are really um, tied to their separation of concerns because they have their HTML, they have their CSS, they have their JavaScript. They like that modularity that tools like Webpack have given them. And that is really cool. It is nice to have you know, each of those files separate. And it really goes against everything we've been taught, the kind of hyper-modularization that we've seen with Webpack. Um, it kind of makes this whole thing hard to you know, grasp at first. But I'd like to kind of have a caveat. Um, it's separation of concerns, not separation of technologies. So um, separation of concerns is obviously not the same as separation of technologies. When you're writing a component, you're writing intermingled CSS, JavaScript, and HTML. The HTML and JavaScript link has kind of already been bridged. When we think about Angulars and Reacts and that kind of thing, you're taking JavaScript and writing it through you know, this library or this framework to the HTML. The CSS is just another layer on top of that, and I think they're all three um, necessarily going to be some intermingling. And so if, if we can make that intermingling as clean as possible, that's a win for code clarity and maintainability, not a loss. And so this is a really, really great slide that I've seen recently in some of the CSS and JS people I follow. And so on the left is really separation of technologies. Um, when people see, you know, think, see this whole thing, they, they want this. But when you actually think of what a component is, it's really a blend and a gradient of all of these separate technologies. And you know, each of these together make a component. Um, they're not entirely siloed and separate, and that, that's really not doable all the time. And so also, just think of, I don't know if there's any Vue people in the audience, but Vue has this whole single file um, concept, as does what, as do web components, where 
Um, you have you know, your style, you have your script, and then you have your template. And I, I, I think the kind of appeal of that is it kind of makes it clear that, you know what, these actually are linked, and there actually is some value in writing these all together. So we haven't even defined what it is, so you know, classically I start with what it's not. Um, so uh, CSS and JS is not, or at least not exclusively, inline styles. CSS and JavaScript at its best leverages CSS and the power of CSS. So this means the best parts of CSS that everyone likes, whether that's you know, media queries and pseudo styles like hover and before and after, um, that those still exist and those still are usable. So when I see this um, described as you know, a critique of CSS and JavaScript, I don't think it's a super valid critique because I don't think this is the best possible implementation of CSS and JavaScript. It is a implementation, but I don't think it's the best one. So no, not, not my favorite. <laughs> So let's actually, you know, it's high time to actually begin talking about what it actually is and why it matters. So we'll go over some high-level goals of CSS and JavaScript as well as what it can do. Um, we'll also discuss in some detail uh, how it can solve some of these previously mentioned problems um, with CSS. So um, the very first thing is CSS and JavaScript is an abstraction upon CSS. And so when you think of how, of when and why CSS and HTML were created, they were created to create a document and then to style that document. So I think of like a PDF. And so it makes sense that all of these selectors are global because when you want to style an H1 in like a document, that makes sense that you'd want each of them to be styled the same way. Globals are actually good in that context. But you know, HTML is not necessarily a document anymore. Now it's an application. Now you can do, do progressive web apps. You can do all kinds of things. And so I think CSS and JavaScript ab abstract style to the component level. And so really, um, what I think CSS and JavaScript does is it brings CSS uh, into the component age. And so just in a similar way <coughs> excuse me, that uh, React and Angular are abstractions on JavaScript, CSS and JavaScript abstracts upon the base model of CSS and I think fixes some of those previously mentioned problems. So it's also true encapsulation. And so uh, how it actually does this technically is it creates a hash based on what you've given it. And I'll show you some real codes that makes a lot more sense. Um, and so this hash is the class name. So it's applying a real style, and then it's giving it a, a real class name based on that style it created. And so this gives us a Shadow DOM-like effect today without a polyfill because that hash is necessarily going to be unique. And so like I said you know, with the previous slide, it, do, it truly does bring the component era to CSS and it eliminates and solves some of those issues um, like globals and dead code elimination. It's also a more powerful CSS. So by, by just simple virtue of using JavaScript, you can do things like assigning and you can use objects and um, you can really extend uh, your CSS to be um, really what you want it to be with JavaScript. And I'm not saying it's teaching in new rules. That's not what CSS and JavaScript is, but it's authoring you know, your rules in JavaScript. And so that also allows for things like full sharing of constants. So useful for, for breakpoints and colors and anything that you might want to use in your JavaScript. Uh, you can use it in your JavaScript and your CSS and you can be entirely certain that they're actually constants and they're not going to fall out of sync. Additionally, especially in the React world, um, you can inject and modify based on props or attributes. And so rather than you know, a separate cascading uh, class name or a separate cascading style, um, what we do is we pass in a prop. So if you think back to the button example, I could pass in an inverted prop and I would just you know, use a different style object when it's inverted and extend on that base style. There's a different way of thinking about things. This is a really uh, crucial uh, one about CSS and JS. So the libraries that I like best and I think are most, most worth investigating are uh, really under the hood. They do real style sheets. So they're appending actual style tags to your you know, head tags. And so that means that you get the good parts of CSS. You get media queries, you get pseudo styles, hover, um, at, before, after. All the stuff that we like about CSS. But it also cures the bad parts of CSS. So that means globals, leaky abstractions, dead code elimination, all the stuff that we don't like about CSS. And so if, if you already know CSS, that's perfect because the, you'll actually really like these tools because you're writing CSS. And so use the properties, rules, flexbox, you know, whatever you like about CSS, use that in this um, CSS and JS um, construct. So this is what I call a component styling solution, or CSS. And so this is really kind of throw back to the previous slide. It brings CSS into the component age. Um, we've removed globals from JavaScript. Why not do the same with CSS? 
And then it's also a JavaScript styling solution, or JSS. So obviously this means it uses JavaScript to write styles. So this means you can leverage the full power of the JavaScript ecosystem. And I think this has a lot more benefits than people might realize. So think of you know, importing um, an NPM dependency into your application. So if that has a separate CSS style, then you have to set up a CSS loader you know, to make that, um, to, get this, to get this style working, or you have to use a link tag. Um, when, you, when you write your components uh, in this way, especially for ease of distribution, you import a single file from JavaScript, and the other stuff takes over after that. So it's easy to use, distribute, uh, load with a module bundler of choice. And I'm not going to get into a ton of detail on this, um, but uh, I think a really interesting space is when you abstract. So think of like React Native. And so a lot of these libraries I'm talking about also have native analogs. So you're writing what appears like CSS, but under the hood, because they're using CSS and JavaScript, you're writing what looks like CSS, and it's translating it to actual native CSS-like code. So I think that's a really exciting area to keep an eye on. So semantic elements. So if anyone's not familiar with what this term means, um, I think of HTML5. So HTML5 gave us you know, header and footer and section and aside and main. Um, all of these elements um, that uh, make it more clear, the meaning, by just looking at the actual tag name and the code. And so when you think back to before HTML5, you know, everything was a div. And that's not great for readability and understanding what code is actually doing. Um, so, so semantic elements are actually really solid. And so let's compare an example. So on the left, we have a React component. And then let's say it's using a vanilla CSS um, implementation. It can be whatever, because it's just using class names under the hood. So we do have a single semantic element. Uh, header, class name is header. Um, and then we have, you know, the separate div. Uh, so this is our brand, this is our branding. So this could be colored a certain way, um, whatever, doesn't really matter. We have our logo, and then we have our brand name. And then below, or, you know, to the right of this, we have our username. We have this, you know, uh, wrapper div. So it'll float to the right. We uh, print out username or user email. And then we have this logout link. And so when you look at the same code written in CSS and JS, it's, you know, fully semantic. So we have the styled header. We have our brand, our branding. Um, we have our user welcome, we have our username, and we have our logout link. At a glance, you can quickly see that this code is a, a lot clearer, you know, what it's actually intending to do based on this tag name. So this is really a benefit to React and to CSS and JS, but I think it's worth pointing out. And so I really like this slide because it's really the mental model that you have to have when you're developing CSS. So this is the CSS side versus when you're developing um, CSS and JavaScript. So I have HTML, and I need to give it some class names. Let's think of those, you know, the button and then secondary. And then those themselves are created from cascading rules. So not only do those rules cascade, but I have to keep that in my mind of what is cascading, specificity, you know, kind of surprisingly hard problems to figure out in CSS. And then those rules themselves are created from styles. So there's a level of indirection here when you're writing your actual HTML code because you have to go up the tree and figure out you know, where these are coming from, what's creating the style, because these are all globals. On the right is the CSS and JS approach. So we have styles, we have a styled component, and then this renders HTML to the DOM. There's, there's no uh, separate thing I need to learn or separate thing I need to uh, know about. There's no cognitive model of you know, do, these rules, do these rules stack, what rule is more specific. It's I'm writing a component, I expect it to be encapsulated. That's that. So I think it's a very... Um, you know, great model. And like I said, anything that can make me think less and develop more, I'm a big fan of. So we've talked a lot about CSS and JS, but I haven't really showed um, a lot of libraries to actually instrument, you know, uh, this tooling. Because like I said, at the bare minimum, CSS and JS is enabled with React with that inline style. But I don't think that is the best approach. So I want to be clear here. They're not all React-based, uh, but mostly. And so some of these, and I'll point them out in particular, they, they might have underlying libraries that um, allow you to you know, use this, this base library in something like Angular or something like Vue. But in general, most of these are React-based because that's kind of where a lot of this development is really happening. And so uh, one important thing I'd like to note here is um, if you're not a React person, that's, that's okay. Uh, try not to gloss over and you know not care about those libraries because I think they have some really great ideas that even if they're not in your framework of choice right now, I think they will be possibly soon um, or they will be someday. Or you can just at least take ideas uh, in structuring your code 
that these libraries have. So style components is what I call the gateway drug to CSS and JavaScript libraries. And so the reason why I say this is because you're actually writing, you know, like I said, real CSS, and you're also writing it as a CSS string. And so what that actually looks like is this slide. So um, the base styled import, up here there'd be import style from style components, um, exposes a bunch of JSX or HTML tags. So anything you'd want to style, whether it's an A tag, whether it's a button, whether it's a div, um, you can just call style dot that element. And then it takes a uh, template string, so this is actually a tag template literal, which means under the hood it's actually a function, um, which doesn't matter. Uh, but so this is real, you know, this is real CSS. You could actually copy and paste code from your existing CSS solution and, you know, paste it right here. And then here's where the kind of dynamism and, you know, the whole um, writing it in JS kind of uh, comes into play. So this is a React, um, React uh, library. And so um, when I have props and when I have this props.primary, then I'm going to also extend upon this base style with this primary style that I've defined. So when I pass primary to this button, um, the background color will change to white, and the color will be this pale violet red. And I don't need to think about you know, specificity and whether something else could be affecting this. This is purely encapsulated because of the, you know, the unique hashing and other stuff that this library offers you. So I'm a really big fan of style components. Uh, I think if you're going to start anywhere, definitely start here. Uh, I think it's a really, really solid one uh, to start with. So Glamorous is a relatively recent framework, and so it built on some of the ideas of style components, in particular, um, the idea of exporting uh, each of those JSX elements. And so um, the, the major difference between Glamorous and style components is that Glamorous expects style objects, um, and then uh, style components expects style strings. And so it can be quite kind of a, um, a mental shift in writing. You know, if you're so used to writing CSS with the dasherized and as a string, uh, it can be a little bit of a shift to start writing it like this, where it looks like an inline style, but this is actually uh, going to be converted with a Glamorous compiler into you know, actual CSS. And so what's really cool about this is, so um, right here again, I'm, I'm making a link, calling a big link, and it's an A tag. And so this um, A tag function can take one to many arguments. And so each of these arguments are merged on top of one another for as many as I want to do. And these arguments can also take can also be a function or they can be a plain object. And so if it's a function, this is, this is my props. And so when I have a primary prop, then I'm going to use this background color. When I don't, I'm going to fall back to this. Um, so you kind of get the idea. And what, what's kind of cool here is you can see how you do um, pseudo styles and media queries and you know the stuff we actually like about CSS. You do that here, it's just a, it's just a nested property on that object. So Emotion is um, not quite as popular as the other two, but I think it's really worth mentioning because it has one really novel idea. Um, and so really what it does is it leverages ideas from both glamorous and style components. And so you can write styles as a string or as a style object. So it's really author preference. And then the really interesting thing about it is it has a, a, a Babel plugin that compiles away the compiler uh, at build time. So if anyone's an Angular developer, think Angular ahead of time compilation. It does some kind of similar things for the CSS and JavaScript. And so I'm not saying it's not shipping a runtime at all, but the runtime is drastically reduced when you use this Babel plugin, which is really, really cool stuff. And I, I think the ideas here um, will probably shift and be uh, implemented in some of the other ones we talked about as well. And so the actual code, uh, it looks pretty similar to what we've looked at previously. Uh, I'm not using any props here, but it would work the same way. Um, here is you know, a hover style. Um, that pseudo style and um, the main difference is rather than being on you know a property on this main thing it's actually a function call which expects the HTML tag so um, and I forgot to mention but the one thing is so emotion um, generates uh, class names as well so if you wanted to use this um, you just wouldn't give it um, that image tag because that's actually a react component you would uh, actually rather um, just just call uh, a, a separate function and then that'll give you a class name. So you can, you're basically doing CSS modules, uh, but still getting the benefits of writing it in JavaScript. So Polish, has anyone heard of Polish? No? Okay, well Polish is actually really cool too. So um, 
it's, I've heard it described as the Lodash of CSS and JavaScript libraries. I think that's a pretty fair comparison. So if anyone's written SAS or less and used some of the mixins available, so think like Darken and Lighten and Mix and RGBA, um, things that make um, you know, some color manipulation uh, a lot easier. Uh, this is a JavaScript implementation of a lot of those uh, methodologies. It was originally designed for usage in style components, uh, but it actually works in pretty much any CSS and JavaScript lib. And so the actual code, um, Polish just exports a bunch of these, you know, little utility functions. And so when I want to, um, you know, call darken or call lighten, um, so if I call darken with zero, that means don't change this color. If I call darken with the first argument of one, that means this is black. And so it, you have a spectrum of that. And so if anyone's used those mixins, this is the same kind of um, methodology uh, just available to you in CSS and JavaScript. And so there are a bunch of, you know, these methods. These are just the color methods. Um, so some common ones, you know, like I said, RGBA. Um, RGBA can take a hex code, uh, and then you can actually add the alpha channel. So, you know, if, if, if I say FFF, like I would know the RGBA for that. But if I say it, like a blue, I'm not going to know that intuitively. And the RGBA makes that easier and lets me make that color semi-transparent. It also has a bunch of other helpers. Um, there's conversion between M and REM helpers. There's radial gradient generators. Um, shorthands for common things like text overflow ellipsis, um, font face. Uh, a lot of really cool things. So definitely check out Polished if you're finding a CSS and JS um, stuff novel or interesting. So I have this chart. Um, this is just downloads per month. And you know, to be clear, popularity contest is not the best way to choose um, much of anything. Uh, but style components is uh, pretty much uh, the de facto winner as far as popularity goes. One important note is that Glamorous relies on Glamour. So Glamour is actually the underlying library. And you can use Glamour with Angular or React or, or Angular or um, Vue um, if, you, if you don't want the React ecosystem. And uh, Motion not, hasn't quite caught on yet, but I think it's going to, uh, I think it has some really good ideas. Radium is one of the first. Um, I wouldn't highly, highly recommend Radium. Radium uses inline styles. Um, and then it kind of uses some JavaScripty stuff to emulate uh, hovers and um, before and after and that kind of stuff. And so Radium's fallen a little bit out of favor, but as you can see, it's still really, really popular. So um, kind of surprising to see that actually. So again, GitHub stars um, by far style components is uh, you know far and away the winner. Um, Glamorous is a relatively recent addition. People are really, really liking Glamorous, so Glamorous is definitely worth checking out. Emotion actually has a surprising amount of stars. Radium, like I said, was one of the first, so it's not surprising it has that many stars. And Aphrodite is a solid approach as well. What was the question? Sorry, so the, I'm, I'm really comparing CSS and JS like libraries. Uh, Polish is more of like a utility that you can use with any one of these. So I, I didn't chart it on the same uh, chart, but Polish is extremely, pop extremely popular. And um, if you're using any one of these, uh, I think you'd be doing yourself a disservice by not using Polished. So it's worth checking out. And then I, I think this is also a really important, possibly uh, underlooked um, uh, aspect. Um, what are you actually shipping to your end user when you're using these libraries? Because they do ship with the runtime. They're parsing your CSS. They're doing things like auto prefixing. Um, style components and Glamorous actually ship like a super small minified post CSS parser, which is actually really cool. Uh, but gzipped, um, at, its, at its biggest, uh, style components is only 39 kilobytes. So in the grand scheme of things, this is pretty small, but it is worth considering that, um, you know, there's a, lot, there's a lot to this one. Glamour is a little smaller, Motion is smaller still, and then there's just one called CSX that I really like. Um, so if you don't need some of the advanced features of, you know, several of these libraries, but if you want to use the CSS and JS um, techniques, um, CSX is, is worth checking out. And so I don't know if you guys can see that, that's 1.2 kilobytes, so that is effectively nothing. Like, that's a pretty small payload to deliver to your end user. And so whenever I, you know, see these new technologies, I do always like seeing who's using them, because it makes me feel um, that, these, that, there, that there's actual validity to using these um, techniques. And so minimally, these are the ones that were on style components, um, and that, that use style components, and one of them uses Glamorous. Uh, but companies like Microsoft and Target and PayPal and Bloomberg, and Reddit, and Atlassian, at, at, at at um, they're, they're all using these, um, you know, these libraries, at least to some extent. And then, of course, uh, Facebook's using them, and then Twitter is using them as well. So 
Um, I think if someone like Microsoft can use them, then I think there's actual validity to some of these ideas. Yeah, but Microsoft is a big place. Yeah, true. Okay. Maybe, but maybe some small out of the way. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I don't, I don't know whether it's one guy at Microsoft using it somewhere or whether it's you know fifty percent of Microsoft. I, it's hard to know. Um, so I can say Twitter. Twitter used it for their Twitter Progressive web app. So their web app they shipped to mobile um, is written with with one of these CSS and JS libraries. So I can't speak to what Microsoft uses because you know this is just on like one of the library's sites. Like here's who uses us. But um, so that's a good point. Yeah, I don't know what the extent of the usage is, but worth considering. So actual real world real world world usage. I wanted to give each of you a feel for what it feels like actually writing code in each of these libraries. So doing some common things like theming, um, using props, um, composing or extending your components. Um, things that you'll actually be doing when you're developing a, a real application. And so I'm not endorsing any particular library. Um, I just wanted to show each of them um, you know, doing some real world, real world stuff. And so again, nearly all of these examples are React based, uh, but underlying ideas could be used in other libraries or frameworks. So I've kind of already given you a hint at what this looks like, but this is styled components. And so we have this container. It is a main element, so a semantic HTML5 element. Uh, we have a background color, and then when we pass in padding, we'll use that value. If padding is not passed in, then we'll just default to zero. And then likewise, we have this button. This is actually a really simplified example of that earlier button I showed you. And so uh, by default, it's gonna be have a blue background and then a white um, text color. And then when inverted is passed, then it's going to swap those out pretty much and then apply these styles instead. So composition, how do we, you know, given these elements, how do we extend them and how do we do some things that we're used to in CSS? And so what we, what we do is we create kind of a base element. Mouse. And so this is a base alert, very simple. Uh, it's going to have a light gray background and then a dark gray text color. And then we can extend upon this. And so if we just, rather than calling glamorous with a div or you know, whatever H, uh, HTML tag, if we call it with an element, it'll extend upon this alert, apply these styles, and then anything that is uh, overrides will be, um, you know, we'll take the ones we passed in. And um, anything that already exists and that I don't override will ex still exist in this component. So let's say I had another property um, font size bold that would exist in this as well as the colors, the properties we've overridden. So it's, it's basically cascading, it's um, uh, inheriting from the previous component. So again, I just wanted to drive home the point, the point that this is real CSS. So again, it's a style of components. And so I'm, right, I'm doing things like <coughs> pseudo hover styles. I'm using media queries. And these will all work just like I'd expect. There's no magic here. This is you know, real CSS injected into a real style tag. So I think that's really cool. Um, and yeah, if you like CSS, you'll like style of components. So one uh, really interesting thing that I hadn't really considered before putting this presentation together is what about keyframes? So keyframes are inherently um, a global. When you create a, a keyframe animation, you're saying like uh, keyframe this name, and then later you're going to use that name um, in your animation property. And so style components, um, emotion, glamorous, they all contain these little helpers. Uh, so this keyframes function. And so I can generate this keyframe. Uh, it'll generate a unique animation name for me. And then I can then use that in my code. So this avoids that, sidesteps that problem of globals and uh, gives us the, the same kind of technique we like for you know, our components, for our animations as well. So this is a really interesting point. So style components, glamorous, um, emotion, pretty much all the ones I've been mentioning, what they do is they kind of paint a component with a class name. So they add their unique class name and then that's where those styles come from. So if you're designing a component library, or if you possibly think that your component could be used by someone who wants to use CSS and JavaScript, the best advice I can give is if you're, if you're using React, um, expose a class name property and then apply that to your element. So really here, if you're writing a non-CSS and JS um, component, you would take this class name and then you would add what you are already using for your existing class name, if that makes sense. And so um, also if you're wrapping your components, so um, you know if there's 
if your style component is one level deep and you're just using a simple wrapper, um, you would still want to pass that class name down to that style component, and then you can still extend upon um, using any of these libraries. So this is also a common question. How do I use an external library that isn't written in CSS and JS? And so uh, one really cool technique is um, in Glamorous, also in style components. And so uh, if anyone's familiar with Bootstrap, Bootstrap you know, likes a lot of CSS classes. And so to get an alert, you use alert, and then you uh, do alert, dash, and then the type of the alert. And so in Glamorous, we can make this a styled component, and then we can actually call it with type equals success. And then this will, under the hood, make the class name alert space alert dash success. And so that'll actually render to a bootstrap alert under the hood. Same thing as style components. Uh, the API is a little bit different, but it's really doing the same thing. We are taking uh, props, um, we're doing alert, and then alert dash, whatever we pass in, and then we default to info. And then what's kind of cool is I'm also showing how you can extend upon that too. So um, uh, you can add you know, the this, this style um, to any of these bootstrap alerts. So theming is a common concern uh, and actually can be kind of hard for CSS. Um, it can be kind of hard to maintain these two separate, um, you know, entirely different themes. And CSS and JS libraries generally expose what's called a theme provider, which then makes um, your kind of base JavaScript object, uh, so your rules and colors, your paddings, your kind of uh, underlying style uh, available to these components. And it's super easy to make, you know, a light dark uh, variant, for example. Um, any kind of styling, you know, theming that you want to do, it's really actually really easy in these libraries. So this is the first part of it. We have our theme. Our theme is just a JavaScript object. Um, so we define some things like background and text um, for light and then dark. And then we define what our current theme is. And so obviously there'd be more than background and, and text. There'd be padding and you know whatever else. Um, and then in our actual component, um, when we use this theme provider, this property theme is injected. And then we can actually use this to get what's currently defined. And so this is a really you know, slick and uh, easy way to theme your components. And how, how the actual underlying code looks, um, at, the, at your root level, you use this theme provider, you pass it a theme, and then any um, components inside of this will have access to that theme prop that will be injected for you automatically. So in the interest of fairness, uh, there are definitely some drawbacks, I think, that are worth considering. And so I'd like to uh, highlight a few of them. So the, the first and probably most important one, um, this uses JavaScript. So um, if, if your users don't have JavaScript enabled, which is 0.2%, um, that number is kind of hard to find, but I think it's somewhere around there. Um, I cited my source. Um, what, what do you do? You can't, you can't show them an entirely unstyled component. And so uh, this is kind of where progressive enhancement and this kind of clash a little bit. And so what, 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 what I think you can do is um, you can mitigate um, by either statically rendering um, your React components, uh, or you can server-side render uh, and ship down um, the, a, a minimal payload, you know, kind of like a starter page, and then you can let React take over and then style as needed. And so 0.2% um, to me is not like a huge uh, number, but if your Facebook scale are driving a lot of traffic, it could be a concern. So um, if you have a million monthly users, that means 2,000 users may not be getting a usable site. Uh, they'd be getting an unstyled site. So this is something worth considering uh, when you're approaching these libraries. This is a quote from Rich Harris. He's a really smart guy. He wrote Spelt and uh, Rollup. If anyone's familiar with those um, tools and libraries, uh, he says, uh, rest in peace, readable class names, murdered by CSS and JavaScript, another nail in the coffin of the scrapable, view-sourceable web. And so I hope you guys can actually see... Um, nope that uh, class names, well, they're, they're a unique hash, which is good, um, you know, when we're, when we're thinking of eliminating globals, but when you're going in, you know, in uh, your production build, and you're trying to figure out, well, what is this element? Uh, it can be a little bit hard, and so there are ways you can, you can use both, you can use any of these libraries to append not only that unique class, but also a semantic class. So that's a kind of best practice I'd recommend doing. Uh, Twitter clearly hasn't done it, but I'd probably personally do it myself. And so this is also a really uh, common complaint levied at CSS and JavaScript, and this is really editor tooling. Um, so editor tooling hasn't quite caught up, and this is fair, of writing CSS and JavaScript like it has for writing CSS in CSS. So you know, CSS has been around for 
however many years, and this you know technology is just two or three years old. And so editor tooling, like on the left, when I'm writing a glamorous style object, when I write color, it's giving me you know global JavaScript um, uh, auto completion rather than you know when I'm writing color under a main in an actual CSS file, it's going to give me color. And then you know when I go in and I want the actual property, you know it give me hex codes or whatever. Um, so this is actually a, a cause for concern, but this is getting better. So this is Atom, and this plugin just came out, I think, actually last week. And um, you can write it, you know, as you can see, just as if, just as if it was CSS. And so uh, while this might be a concern now, I do think that as this uh, technique is popularized and continues to grow, um, this will be less of a concern, and editor tooling will be right there where we expect it with CSS. Again, so this is actually one of the creators of style components. If anyone is a WebStorm person, um, they just are working on integrating support style components. Um, uh, they have a pull request. Uh, this was just like last week. It might have been merged in. It could actually support style components out of the box with WebStorm. And so again, this just came out last week uh, as well. So um, as with anything, if you're directly injecting user input, that means even into CSS, you do open yourself up to some issues. And so I'm not going to talk a whole lot about it. Uh, there's a great article that I linked to at the end of this presentation on React Armory. And so he basically showed a kind of a proof of concept um, of how uh, if you inject, um, inject styles, so let's say there's a website that lets me set a hex code, um, and then that hex code is then the background color of the application. You can do things like password sniff. Um, you, know, you can do some injection that I wouldn't have necessarily thought was possible with CSS, uh, but it's a really cool kind of um, you know, uh, uh, thing I didn't necessarily consider when I'm writing this. So really the golden rule is uh, if you're going to accept user input, sanitize it. Um, and then if you don't need to accept user input, then don't accept user input. Um, so it might not be a huge issue for you know, every application you're working on, but it is something to consider. So performance. So this is a big question mark for me currently. Uh, it's not something that I had a whole lot of time to delve into before this talk, uh, but it is something I'd like to investigate in the coming months um, before November. Uh, but in general, it seems hard to me to believe CSS and JavaScript is one-to-one -one with CSS because, the, because of the, the layers of abstraction the libraries we're adding. Uh, but I'm not sure yet this performance difference is meaningful. Um, but stay tuned. I'll be posting on Twitter some findings as I start investigating this. And I'm sure there's going to be more people investigating this to see you know, what is the performance cost of using some of these libraries. So uh, wrap up. I mean, what do we make of all this? Um, CSS and JavaScript, for me, and I think for a lot of others, it solves those very real problems of CSS, those drawbacks that I highlighted at the beginning. CSS and JavaScript can solve those and I think, in what I think is a really clean way. Um, and it, it, it does so in a, in a pretty much developer-friendly way, a way that um, you know, uh, I don't need to think about all these problems as I'm writing CSS. They're handling it for me with this tool. Um, performance may be a concern, as is reliance on JavaScript. Um, so if that's your foremost concern when you're writing this, um, definitely investigate that before you go today and start writing CSS and JS stuff. Um, but overall, I feel pretty confident about a lot of this stuff. I think this is some really, really cool stuff. I think it fixes some valid concerns of CSS, and I'm really excited of where we're going um, with a lot of this stuff. Uh, and then so, you know, if I were to start a new project today, uh, I'd author it using one of these libraries. Um, I, I, think it's really, I think it's really great. It's a really great developer experience. It solves some of the problems, like I said, that I've experienced, and um, I think it's just, it's a really, you know, great, a great new technology. So I do have a demo. Um, I built this little tool that I call CSS and JS Playground. And so this is, uh, like I said, that what I call CSS and JS Playground. And so I was really inspired by some of the tools like Code Sandbox and Webpack Bin. And so what you have on the left is you know, a live code editor. And then what you have on the right is a preview of what that code actually looks like. So what I've done is I've uh, recreated this uh, form that I really like from Stripe, uh, one of their mobile uh, mockups, and I've recreated it in some of the libraries we've been talking about. So you can actually go through, you can actually go through, and you know I can see what this exact form looks like, you know, in Glamorous. I can see what it looks like when I write Aphrodite. Aphrodite. I can see what the code looks like when I write in Radium. And then the cool thing is, it's a little bigger. 
um, you know, when we change things. So I, let's say I change the title. It updates, you know, live as I'm typing, which is pretty cool. Um, and then I'm, you know, highlighting some of the cool things about CSS and JavaScript. Uh, this form becomes enabled and change color um, when the, you know, when the, the fields are valid and that are required. So I think it's a really cool thing. Um, definitely come check this out if you're interested in these technologies. Um, I have links to it at the end. Um, uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm really proud of this. I think it's pretty cool. Um, so yeah, definitely take a look. And So, um, you know, the whole standing on the shoulder of giants. Uh, these were all really good presentations and talks that I uh, watched or read or whatever uh, making this um, presentation. So uh, if you find this stuff interesting, definitely come back to the slideshow and ch uh, check out some of these links. They're definitely worth looking at. Um, you know, like I said, I have my playground links and then the repo for this slide deck. And uh, with that said, uh, do, does anyone have any questions? Yeah? So uh, for full disclaimer, I consider myself very much a, a, a novice a JavaScript program. Mm -hmm. um, I love the idea. I'm fully on board with it. I've attempted to, to do some on my own um, CSS and JS. Mm -hmm. um, I found myself, however, creating a few proposals in there. So you brought up, uh, I guess, headers is an easy one. Mm -hmm. um, should I try to cure myself of that thing completely, or is there a so, use case where you maybe mix and match? Are, are you kind of saying that you'd like some kind of like reusable snippets that you could then use? Um, or is there... Maybe I have some common theming, you know, across the board. So in general, I want most buttons to look like this, but when I'm mm -hmm. developing my components, I may have specific use case scenarios where mm -hmm. I'm going to specify very in a declarative fashion. Mm -hmm. Here's what the style should be for the buttons with the use case. Okay, yeah, so I, I guess how I would handle that is you might use that theme provider, and so you have this base theme that kind of establishes, you know, your kind of branding guidelines for your application. And then, um, you know, you might have a custom button that shows that composability I showed. So you take this button and then you kind of ignore the theme and then you extend it how you want. So I think that is kind of the best of both worlds. You get that like base level theme for most of your components, but then you can also make those extensible um, using that whole composability extension that I showed on that one slide. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. Have you worked with like any pure designers and how have this worked into their workflow? Um, so I actually haven't, but that's a pretty interesting area. So um, a lot of the CSS and JS stuff has been used um, and with React. So an interesting area is, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the design tool Sketch, um, but some of this can actually render down to actual Sketch components. And so I don't think HTML is necessarily totally outside the realm of designers. And so they can actually give you these Sketch mockups uh, written in CSS and JS and written in some of these. So I think it's a really exciting area, uh, but I haven't actually done it myself, personally. Yeah? So um, I'm a big fan of CSS modules, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering, those, those are basically not CSS and JS, right? They're, um, they're, they can be done and have no JS required. What does adding the JS give you besides the ability to switch some stuff just based on the product? And why not? You could do that anyway based on changing the class name based on the property. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, that just comes down to the whole like drawbacks I illustrated at the beginning. Um, so if, if, it's an, if it's an argument of what does this do that CSS modules doesn't do, um, I, there's not a great answer for that. Uh, it does a lot of that theme provider stuff. Um, there's that whole semantic stuff I talked about. You know, I think there's a, an improved um, developer experience when writing all this stuff. Um, and then I've, the way I've used CSS modules is I do actually import my class name <laughs> from my CSS, and that's harder to do, uh, a little more effort to do, than I think it is authoring some of this stuff. So that said, I, I basically prefer CSS and JS uh, over CSS modules because of the kind of developer experience, which I know is a little bit cop outy, but um, <laughs> uh, I, I guess that's basically how I would answer. It's really a personal preference. And so one thing I didn't say, and I probably will say if I give this talk again, CSS modules is a great solution. Like if, if you like CSS and if you, you know, you like some of the stuff I've showed you with eliminating globals and all that kind of stuff, definitely go that route. I would highly advise anyone to at least start there. Um, so yeah, it's not a, not an either or necessarily. I think, I think both are valid um, solutions to this problem. Yeah? Uh, is there any integration with like this SAS or less to 
tools, or do you need to basically convert your SAS file into using CSS or JS? Um, so there, there's no integration. It's all it's all JavaScript. As far as the integration goes, you know, if you are using some of those mixins, which I know when I write SAS, I I, lo I love those mixins. So definitely check out Polish because you can probably pretty much straight port some of your mixins um, to JavaScript. I mean, uh, a, a mixin in SAS you can write in JavaScript too, um, with you know with this technique. So um, yeah, there's definitely going to be some translation cost of I have these styles in SAS and I have to also you know, change how I'm doing some of this. I have to re recreate this mix-in that might not exist in Polished. So there's going to be some, you know, um, cost of that, but I think it's worth doing for all the reasons I, you know, prescribed above. Yeah? You briefly mentioned it, but um, in Vue, you write, you can write styles within Vue components, and so that would be essentially what we're doing here with React. Yes, and then actually, so Vue and Angular, they both ship with what is, what I'd call, kind of a CSS modules-like implementation, and so you can scope your styles to just that component. So um, by, by default, you get the, the CSS modules-like effect um, when you add a scoped attribute in view, and then I think Angular by default is scoped. And when I say Angular, I mean Angular 2, 4, whatever. Angular JS, not so much. Yep. Yeah, um, so I mean you you definitely lose some of that um, because yeah you are you are architecting your you know like I said your styles in JavaScript um, the one though I, I thought someone might ask this and so um, what I would say is the style components approach of where it's actual you know CSS is what it is authored as so I think that would be the easiest one if you're uh, worried that you know you know we use React now I think it's kind of the Get a lot of popularity. What are we going to use in a year or two? And so, if that's a if, if that's a concern for you, um, then style components might be a solid option. As would you know vanilla CSS with CSS modules, uh, if that's a real big concern for you. Is anybody um, working to maybe try and bridge that gap with just CSS and JS? Um, I'm not really sure about that one. I have to get back to you. Um, yeah, uh, feel free to like ping me on Twitter, and I, I might. Uh, like look up an answer for that. I'm not sure offhand. Yep. Okay. Um, so the also re re uh, requisite thanks slide. Uh, T Hanks. Um, so uh, like I said, uh, everyone here, I really appreciate everyone coming. Um, if you have any feedback, uh, I'll be I'll be doing the whole. Um, where are we going? Uh, DJ, DJ dugout? No, not not DJs. Wherever we're going, the bar. <laughs> uh, I will be there. Come come talk to me. Uh, let me know what you thought of it. And then um, I do have a feedback form. So if, 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 if anyone's against this, I won't email this out. Uh, but any feedback you guys have, um, I would really appreciate if you can uh, let me know. So uh, thank you. Really appreciate it. <laughs>